Good morning, church. My name is Emily, um, and it is my privilege to speak with you, or to you, maybe with you as well, <laughs> um, afterwards, um, but to, to share God's word to you this morning. Oh, a sign of, of middle age. I'm just going to, I'm going, I'm going old school today, so I don't, I don't have anything that's going to come up on, on the screen, so apologies if that means that it's a bit, a bit trickier um, for you to kind of follow um, in, terms of, in terms of the reading, but please bear with me. Um, I'm going to be reading from Acts 16, um, starting at verse 11. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace. The next day, we went on to Nepolis, and from there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyratia, named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshipper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned round and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. <coughs> when her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all of the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately, he and all his household were baptised. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. <laughs> 
The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens and threw us into prison. And now, do they want to get rid of us quietly? No, let them come themselves and escort us out. The officers reported this to the magistrates, and when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, requesting that they leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Then they left. Heavenly Father, I just pray for the next few minutes, um, this time of <clears throat> me sharing um, your word here today. Lord, I ask that you open each one of our hearts to the message that you want shared. Amen. So, the title of um, the, the, the sermon today is Philippi. So I thought it only fitting that I just set the scene for you and um, give you perhaps a historical geography lesson um, and actually fill, fill you in, in case you're not familiar with where Philippi was. So Philippi would be in what is modern day Greece. However, before you make any sort of holiday destination plans, um, unless you're an archeologist, um, it's probably worth knowing that it is only now a ruin. Philippi, however, was an important uh, city at, the, at that time. So the Roman, it was a Roman colony, um, and, and it, was, it was a kind of real sort of centre for trade. To kind of give you a bit of a flavour, you might ask the question, what did the Romans ever do for Philippi? But, yeah, um, but that sense of it being a bustling kind of multicultural um, environment a wealthy city um, with, as I say, a range of trades and commerce kind of happening within that, within that area. A bit kind of cosmopolitan may, maybe, and potentially a kind of bit of anything goes, you do you kind of environment. Ring any bells? What we do know, though, is that there weren't any synagogues in the city. And when we think to where we start in this passage, we find Paul and Silas going to meet a small group of, of, of recent converts um, outside um, meeting together to pray. So Philippi, though, is a city of wealthy business owners, enslaved people, kind of with city officials, city employer, employees, and a small proportion of Christian missionaries. I want to unpick as we go through together, some of those key players as you read through, as we read through that passage together. Now, I will hold my hand up and admit to the fact that previously, if I've read this passage, everything that's come early has been all about getting to that kind of crux of that kind of key, you know, um, that key moment in the story, the, the earthquake and the jailer being saved. And so actually, if we're thinking about some of those relationships, certainly I have been guilty of thinking, well, it's all about, it's all about that. You're probably ahead of me, and you've probably sussed that that's not the only relationships that are going on in that passage. But I kind of just want to set out who it is that I want us to be thinking about together um, in terms of those interactions that Paul and Silas had in this passage. So, we're introduced first to Lydia, a wealthy business businesswoman, trader of purple dye and cloth. Uh, we'll come back to her in a minute. We have an enslaved girl, someone who is able <coughs> to predict the, um, fortunes, kind of a bit of a, 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 has a prophetic ability that we know doesn't come from God. Um, who makes a nice bit of money for her owners. We have Roman officials in the mix that we're introduced to. And we have the jailer, 
and his household. I want us to explore Paul and Silas's contact with each of these in turn and kind of think about what that is telling us, what, what we're learning from that. What do we learn from their connections? And importantly, how do their lives change after those interactions? And we need to take that on a step further and to think about actually what do we learn in terms of what that means for our lives. I also want us to dig deeper and to consider Paul and Silas's relationship with God during this episode. There's no doubt that through the course of this passage, we find them at a point where they are experiencing hardship, physical hardship, a really testing situation. I want us to think about what we learn about worshipping God through their example. I'm going to ask us the questions, how do we worship? When do we worship? What do we need to think about kind of when we're worshipping? Do we worship in the hard times? Do we give enough consideration to the power of worship and how worship is a witness to those that don't yet know Jesus? So, we're going to be thinking about relationships. We're going to be thinking about worship. So, let's dig a bit deeper then into Lydia and what we can learn from her interactions with Paul and Silas. So we know that she was a successful business woman. I like the fact actually that last time that I, I shared with you, I had the op opportunity to speak about women of God. And here we are again, I've got that opportunity to share with you um, another, another woman of God. What we learn is that Lydia is, is able to have that Christian influence then on her entire household. We're told that she, um, she was a real kind of hostess and opened up her house to mean that actually the, the church at Philippi was, was kind of out of her front room. I think it's important to kind of get that in, in our minds, that, that context um, of, of those circumstances. And should in the future... You, you read Paul's letter to the Philippians, then you kind of have that in mind that in all likelihood, Paul's letter was being delivered to Lydia's house. In my preparatory reading, um, I came across um, one writer who spoke about the significance of, of Lydia as, a, as, a, as a, a seller of purple dye or, or of purple cloth. Purple, um, you may be aware, was a symbol of real wealth and luxury. For those of you into in the finer, um, I don't know if it's biological, anyway, the way in which they make purple dye in those times was something to do with loads and loads, and I mean loads and loads of tiny little sea, sh um, sort of sea snail shells, or kind of sea creatures, ground up, and there you go, you had the colour purple. So, I guess... That's quite labour-intensive and, and quite um, specialist, so you can see why that might be expensive. Um, but Lydia was consequently a woman with financial means and likely, therefore, some degree of social standing, um, potentially of influence. And linked to that is that idea that, that purple was a symbol of, of royalty and honour. The writer went on to say how purple is a symbol of transformation, linking the change that um, Lydia experienced after hearing Paul's message to how her life was different, um, that, that link between dyeing something that perhaps was, you know, maybe just a beige into a bright purple. L Lydia was transformed after hearing Paul's message, kind of indicating growth in Lydia's life. Regardless of the symbolism... I think, more importantly, what we're being told about Lydia is her faith was evident in her actions. She gets baptised after hearing Paul's message. 
But she doesn't finish there. She opens her house up to kind of the service of those, those Christian ministries about the, of the fledgling Christian church in Philippi. She provides practical support to Paul and Silas during that time. I think that there's a lot for us to unpick and consider when we think about that. We go from one end of the social spectrum to the other when we then consider the enslaved girl who has the gift of fortune telling. I think something that struck, struck me as I read the passage was that it describes Paul as being annoyed. Again, in my preparation and I'm kind of wanting to unpick and understand a bit about this, I read a few different perspectives in terms of why this might have been. One is perhaps more a literary explanation in terms of the Greek translation. <coughs> my understanding of grammar, grammar was very much based on a kind of 80s and 90s um, education where basically we didn't get taught it. And everything I've consequently learned about grammar has been from my children's education. But <laughs> a key point that was made in terms of this translation is in relation to the definitive article. You may well know what the definitive article is. I didn't. The definitive article refers to the way of salvation or a way of salvation. In the passage that I read, she is um, stated as saying that, that Paul and Silas were offering the, um, the, the one true God's message of the way to salvation. Um, Alternative translations may say that um, he, she was saying a way of salvation. So it's possible that actually there, that there was cons Paul was concerned that actually she was saying that it was a way. It was one of a number of ways that she was muddying the waters and creating a confusing picture about the message that they were there in Philippi to share. It's also possible that within that culture, there was scope for further confusion. Because although Jews and other converts would recognize in what she, she said, that she was referring to the, who the Most High God was, others within that community, others within that melting pot of cultures within Philippi, may have thought that actually she was referring to Zeus. And Paul could not allow any confusion in terms of the message and who it was that he was talking about. However, we can unpick and we can think about this in a different perspective as well. Further consideration of the use of the word annoyance could lead us to reflect on whether or not that emotion is directed at the girl or at her owners. Is it possible that actually Paul's annoyance is directed at the owners and their treatment of this enslaved person? They were profiting from what she was, what she was saying, what her exhaustions were. It's possible that Paul did not want his message of true freedom to be associated with a business profiting from an enslaved girl's ability. And he wanted to set her free from those chains. So whether it's annoyance or possibly other translations suggest indignation, it, we're still kind of wanting to consider what, why was there a delay? Why did Paul on the first contact that he had with this young woman not release her at that point, point in time. <clears throat> I was encouraged to consider context when, cons when thinking about this. Philippi, as hopefully you've kind of started to grasp, was not an area of significant Jewish or Christian presence at that time. And Paul would have been aware of potential implications of his 
actions. Paul was likely to be mindful of the potential ramifications and may have been thinking about how to navigate this situation. He may have been indignant about the local leaders as well as the owners of the slave girl. He may have been aggravated by the impact that her words were having on the community around her. An early example of disinformation, perhaps. It's also important to consider the significance of God's timing at the point in which Paul felt called by the Holy Spirit to take action. Being mindful of God's timing being perfect in every situation. The significance of God's perfect timing in this, in this story with this interaction with the enslaved girl is a reminder for all of us. So, following Paul's release of the enslaved girl, he and Silas are brought in front of the city officials by her angry owners. In reaction to the owners and the building anger of the collecting crowd, Paul and Silas are flogged with rods. They're then put into prison. And I think it's important to note here, they're not just held in a regular cell, but actually they are put into the deepest part of the jail. And on top of that, they're placed in stocks. Now, this wasn't usual procedure. Was this officials trying to contain men who do something powerful that they don't understand in the name of a god that they thought was foreign? I want to take a minute to, for us to think together about how Paul and Silas must have felt at that point when the door slammed shut. I tend to shy away from imagining too much about any kind of physical brutality. But the reality was they were in pain, likely in the pitch dark, they were feeling uncomfortable, they were probably hungry and thirsty. And yet, in that dire situation, they were worshipping their father, God. Full on praise and singing. I would have loved to have known what they were singing. I'm sure Psalms and scripture, no doubt. And it did lead me to think, I wonder who held the best tune. So I ask the question again. How do we worship? When do we worship? Think back over the last few weeks, months, year. You can delete whichever's most fitting in terms of your time scale and your circumstances. Have we been able to worship in those tough times? Have you been able to experience the powerful impact in your life of worship in these times? When I was thinking, you know, as I was thinking around in kind of in the early stages of, of preparing this, um, this sermon, the, the story of what happens um, to, to Paul and Silas, but then their time in prison in particular, reminded me of, of a book that I read called The Heavenly Man. Some of you, I'm, sh- I'm sure many of you may well have read that yourself. It's, it's about um, a, a Chinese Christian who... Um, in the 80s, in communist China, um, is very um, keen to share his faith and consequently comes to the attention of the Chinese authorities. And um, he, he is 
beaten and, and put into prison, and yet in those circumstances he, he shares how he was able to, to worship God and, and the impact that his time worshipping in, in prison had both for him and for those around him. I don't know, I don't know where you are in, in terms of your circumstances today. If you are currently experiencing one of those valley times, my prayer for you is that you can find a way of being able to further develop your worship time with God. Because what we need to remember is not only do we draw comfort um, from that worship time and honour God and rightly so, there is a huge impact of the witness that our worship in those tough times has on the people that we come into contact with. In this story, there was a physical consequence, an earthquake, earthquake, earthquake even, to the extent that the jail walls shook, the doors were open, and chains fell off. And at this point, we meet the next person with whom Paul and Silas have an interaction with, the jailer. He was likely an ex-soldier, um, and this man, fearful of what he anticipates the likely consequences of being a failed jailer, if your prisoners have escaped, he draws a sword, his sword and intends to end his life. Paul calls out and reassures him that not only if he and Silas stayed, but actually whoever else was in that jail at, at the time as well is also still there. The jailer is convinced of the supernatural power of God and is converted, as are his family, and consequently they tend to Paul and Silas's wounds. I think it's interesting at this point to draw a comparison between the experiences of both Lydia and the jailer. Lydia responds to the words of Paul. She immediately responds in faith. She is converted, baptized, and puts her newfound faith into action by hosting and, and serving others. The jailer responds to the supernatural outcome of Paul and Silas's worship. As I've said, consider the important impact of our worship and what that can have on others. He and his family immediately respond in faith, are converted and are baptised, and they put their faith into action by tending to Paul and Silas. I want to draw out another relationship that Paul and Silas have in this passage. We also need to consider um, that Paul and Silas have contact with the city officials. They were, called, they were called to attend the court the next morning, but they make a point of um, stating that the officials should actually come to them. Paul makes a point of their mistreatment that as Roman citizens, their rights weren't upheld. They weren't given a trial before being punished. Paul calls out the discrimination that they experience. And he was bold in his demands. He wanted the officials to consider their actions. And he wanted a bit of accountability. I'm mindful of the time. So, I want us to think about what does this all mean for us? And I like a little bit of ways of remembering things. So I've got four C's for you to go away and, and unpick and ponder. The first C I'm going to say is care. Are we living out our faith like Lydia and the jailer? Are we demonstrating our care of others? Are we in a position to be able to host, being prepared to open up our home to others, share what we have been given with those around it, us? Are we using our gifts to live out our faith? So, number one, care. Number two, culture. 
Consider our reaction to the cultural context that we live in. Is our frustration at some of society's shifts unfairly directed at individuals when instead it might really be better aimed at systemic issues? Are we seeing those who are vulnerable and exploited and consider whether, considering whether we have a role in supporting them? So two, culture. Number three, we're getting on to the biggies now, conversion. We need to remember both our words and our actions could be what helps somebody on towards their point of conversion. For those of us that have heard that message many times, my challenge firstly to me, and possibly to you, is simply our words and our actions. It's possible that one of those comes to you much easier than the other. Perhaps that's a point for prayer. I know that's true in my life. And then number four, finally, commitment. Lydia and the jailer believed and were baptized. The enslaved girl needed to be set free. Is that you? If you don't know Jesus, perhaps today is a time for you to make that commitment. There'll be an opportunity at the end to be able to come up to the front and somebody will be more than happy to pray with you. And also, though, and this is not an also point, but if you know you are a Christian, but yet you have not been baptised, perhaps this is a prod for your walk with Jesus to consider that next step.